Now we have with us our last interview of the day, Jeff Marks, one of the bright young booksellers in our trade. And Jeff, could you just tell, give us something about your background? Um, where you come from, uh, brothers and sisters, what your parents do, uh, what you do, and take us through high school and college in a sort of like short biography. Well, I was born in Rochester, New York, and uh, my father was a lawyer, and uh, uh, I went uh, to the University of Rochester and uh, started selling books while I was in college, and uh, then went to Albany Law School and became a lawyer and uh, have been practicing law ever since. But uh, I started, uh, as I said, uh, selling books uh, when I think I was a sophomore in college. And how that happened was I uh, got a hold of a book collection that belonged to a client of my father's who lost his building to a loan shark. And the loan shark didn't want the library, so it was given to me. And uh, I didn't know what a first edition was or uh, anything else about it at the time and somehow got interested and uh, uh, went on from there as, uh, uh, as a part-time bookseller. I was never involved full-time, uh, but I became very active and started doing fairs all over the country and made friends with uh, uh, some booksellers that, uh, you know, sort of changed my whole path, really. I don't think you would even know who I was were it not uh, for those people. And now here we are at the, uh, uh, you know, at the end of uh, the book business, and all I can say is uh, it was a lot of fun. Tell me about some of the people you just referred to, these people who you met along the way who were obviously an influence on you. Well, my first great friend in the book trade was Richard Shu of Alphabet Bookshop uh, uh, in those days uh, in Toronto, Ontario. And Richard was very patient with me, and uh, uh, we went over some some uh, big groups of books in those days. And he explained to me what what was good about these books and how you behave with other booksellers and, and the rudiments of the business. Johnson and O'Donnell, Ed O'Donnell and Bruce Johnson were were important to me. Uh, uh, they showed me a lot about how things happen, and then. Uh, and then Peter Stern and I started to work together, and, and uh, Jim Pepper. And that's continued uh, uh, till this day. Uh, that's always, that was, you know, in, in, when I started in the book business, there wasn't an awful lot of cooperation uh, among booksellers. Uh, people didn't own books together, and uh, they competed uh, when, even when they traveled together. And, and I think, I always felt that uh, felt too much affection for these people to be constantly trying to bump them out of the way to grab something. And I think uh, that uh, a lot of people felt that way, and it, it became a kind of a, you know, it's hard to know, because when you're starting, of course, and you're on the outside, everybody seems very cold and forbidding. But I think people are nicer at this now. I think it's probably much more of a softball league than it was what, what, 35 years ago or something like that. Uh, What's the framework time-wise? When did you uh, start to get involved in selling books uh, on a regular basis? Well, I think that must be 1976. Is this when you began to form your affiliations with the people you've mentioned? No, it's a little earlier than that. I, what what uh, really uh, dragged me into the thing was I had the, uh, I was fortunate enough to buy a couple of books uh, for a lot less than they were worth, and that's what that's what uh, I think hooks people into any sort of a thing. <laughs> I made a good profit on those two books, and I was in those days working at some. Uh, very hard jobs that uh, didn't pay very much, and I said, hey, how long has this been going on? And then I took the profit that I made and I uh, gave it back to the house, as we'd say in gambling, four or five times over, uh, making mistakes, and uh, eventually found that you must make these mistakes, you got to keep trying things, and uh, I've done it this weekend, I promise you. Uh, uh, it's. Uh, I never really could figure out, you know, what I was doing when, and when I met uh, Jennifer Larson, who became my wife, who knew 
much, much more about books than I did and about other kinds of books than I did. I learned from her over 15 or 16 years now. Has it been that long? Yeah. Wow. And um, so now uh, I'll try anything, <laughs> often with disastrous results. Mm -hmm. Is your dad still alive? No. Uh, he died in 1999. And uh, he was constantly amazed by uh, what we were doing. And uh, I remember one morning he said, what are you going to do today? I, I said, well, I've got to go to Philadelphia and buy a book. And, and he says, what do you have to pay for the book? He says, and I told him. And he said, well, that's more than I paid for our first house. <laughs> he, uh, he, he couldn't understand the, the way the book business worked. His two complaints were that he says, all you booksellers do is take in each other's washing, <laughs> meaning that we just sold books to each other. There actually were no customers. And the other thing he couldn't understand was all the amount of money that was involved in all these complicated deals, and there was nothing in writing about it. Yeah. It took him a it's long amazing. time to over, overcome his scruples as a, as a very conservative lawyer. He said, how can you do these, these things, <laughs> and, and uh, what do you know about these people? I said, same thing they know about me. I said, we never had a problem like that. Do you have any sort of internet presence? We have about uh, uh, 18,000 books online. In all subjects or just in yep. literature? It's, we don't tend to put the, the better part of our inventory online. These are you know, books that are, for the most part, I think probably under $1,500 or so. And uh, Jennifer spends... 12, 14 hours a day, sending those out and listing more and processing, and, and that part, you know, is still still a business. It's my part of the business that has just, you know, really disappeared. Do you work? You, you've always worked from your premises. You've never had any kind of a shop, or no. never never had any aspirations of having any kind of a shop either. No, I think I saw what it was like for people, at least in our in our area, that had shops and. Uh, didn't seem to, to be something that was necessary. And uh, now we have about 45,000 books in our house, and it's not that big a house. Really? There's almost no room for people in it anymore. Uh, <laughs> Is that and, good or bad? Well, it's bad, uh, because we don't even know what we have. We can scout our own house. I've often said that's the best place to start. Well, I, there are many, many, many interesting things in my house that I'm not aware that we have. And, uh, you know, that's, that, that's no way to conduct a business. But well, I've always made jokes about anybody calling this a business. It's, <laughs> it's not a business at all, really. You took a little break a couple of years ago when things began economically to turn down. You want to talk a little bit about what your thinking was and what your feelings are about the trade? Yep. I, well, I, I, what you mean is I skipped Boston. Uh, two years well, after yeah. having done it for 32 years. Well, the reason it was easy for me to skip Boston was I already have so many books that are in Peter's shop and that Peter could cover this. So that was an easy one to uh, say, why don't we, uh, you know, cut down on, on all this outlay of money and uh, uh, see what happens. Uh, as far as taking a break goes, I thought I knew what was coming uh, uh, in 08, and uh, I think I was right. And I, of course, uh, said plenty about that on the chat line for the ABAA, and uh, I told people that they ought to be putting aside money if they could, and they ought to be prepared for some bad times, uh, which we've got. I also said that I thought that uh, we could not chase our aging customer base away, uh, from this business for three or four or five years with and ever get them back and I think that's proven to be the case too. Um, but the worst thing, you know, what's really wrong with the book trade is the same thing that was wrong with being a travel agent is that this used to be a, a business of middlemen. That's part of what my father was saying. And uh, it doesn't require any middlemen anymore. Uh, you, what you, your instinct about books and your emotion about books and your feelings about books used to have much to do with what you price things and what and people that would want to buy the books from you. And booksellers were the ones that were passionate about the books. Um, and that's all over now. 
because everyone refers to the same set of records, uh, which I'm constantly telling, uh, I've just done Discovery Day outside, and I had 10 people say, well, this is selling on ABE for $300. And I said, no, that's a record of what it will not sell for. Uh, the auction records tell you what it sells for. Uh, but everybody persists in this uh, idea that uh, if, it's, if it's on one of these services, that's what it's worth. And uh, there are too many examples of all these things. The books that are in this room at this book fair are so dazzling and so fantastic, all in the hands of booksellers and so far over the heads of the attendees that uh, it's preposterous. Uh, if you were a serious collector and you said, uh, I'm going to spend a million dollars at the Boston Book Fair this weekend, you wouldn't even, that wouldn't make enough of a dent for anybody to even know you were there. Correct. In terms of when measured against what, what's in that room. And the fact that everything's in the hands of dealers tells you everything you need to know. Is there is an oversupply of everything. And it's just getting worse and worse. And I've, I said this weekend, the best thing that could happen to the book business, not the, not the booksellers, because most of them are not insured, but uh, the book, best thing that could happen to the book business is this hotel burned down. And uh, then when you, you could probably make the argument again that something was scarce. Yeah. It's, I see too many copies of the same thing at ridiculous prices. That's why there is no middle or lower end on the internet anymore, because with a touch of a button, the, the oversupply is revealed to anybody. And that, that, not to say that in the old days that anybody was being dishonest when they said, well, this is a scarce book and I'm going to price it $75. And the local customer would say, well, okay, that seems right to me. Well, nobody knew how many copies there were. Remember, A. Libris was going to corner the market in books. Yeah. How'd that how'd they, work out? How'd they make out? They floundered, and uh, you can't do it. They got bought out, too. Uh, but where are the people coming from that appreciate these things the way we do? It's a certainly a good question. I, have no, I, have, I don't have an answer for that. I don't understand the, 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 the current younger generation very well, but it looks to me as though the most important thing in the world is how many things your telephone will do. Yeah, that, that's pretty cool. I don't see how that translates into any future for me selling, uh, uh, you know, antiquarian books uh, to anybody. But, having said I'm that, I'm starting to sound like Barry Scott. I'm still answering the same question. That's no, okay. Minutes later. You sound like Jeff Marks. Why do we continue to rush around looking for books to buy? Well, I can't help myself. I don't know about you. Well, you could help yourself. And what will help you is when you have no more money Which and can't like do now. it. <laughs> uh, but until then, it looks like everybody will do this uh, that can. But, but all these people in the middle, you only need three booksellers now. Pretty much. And it's not hard to see who the three will be. That's right. But to suggest that everybody else can, can wander around and try to, try to find these books and mark them at full retail and have some other specialist dealer come along and take them off their hands, well, the result of that is what you see in this room, just an array of, of one fantastic thing after another. Just is, is, this, is this kind of situation magnified in, some, in for example, at New York? at the New York Book Fair or at one of the California book fairs? Because the Boston Book Fair is admittedly the smallest of, of the book fairs. No, it's, it's, all the book fairs are the same. Essentially the same? Yeah, I think the regional fairs are more fun now. Well, they're, they're certainly more fun. Uh, did you go over to that uh, other book fair in the castle? I did. No, I'm supposed to be a bookseller. I bought a painting, a print, some hairpins, some needles, uh, some letters and a photograph. Okay, so you didn't buy a single book? I did actually buy one book. It would be a better story if I didn't, but I did buy one little book. But, and, and I've heard a number of booksellers say this weekend, well, we're trying to buy things like this because you can't sell books anymore. I've changed my, my philosophy about it, and I'm, I'm doing more and more pamphlets, ephemera, 
documents and stuff like that. Well, you're that. looking for something that's unique, that can't well, be trumped. Right. And I think that that's the future, to me. I don't know how, how much longer I have in that future, but... Uh, if you, if you want to... You can't buy a copy of To Kill a Mockingbird uh, anymore for a price at which you can sell it to another bookseller, because all the people that... Private people, even, that, and dealers that you're going to buy it from, are looking at the same thing that you are. And uh, what do hasn't happened yet, which is interesting, is that people have not said, even though I'm going to lose money on this piece of my inventory, I'm going to sell it for whatever I can. And if you were my client, I was your lawyer, and you said, here's what I know about this business that I'm in, and here's my financial condition, uh, what would you advise me to do? And if I knew the facts as I know the facts, I would say, sell everything that you can for anything you can get for it and uh, go into something else. You, you see the book business as a dead end? Well, it's a dead end in terms of being a business. If you made enough money during the, uh, the good years and, uh, or you, for some reason, have no economic pressure on you, uh, it's, and you don't get frustrated by things like this, which I unfortunately do, it's a great thing to do. But the idea of making a living at this? You know, and I used to, you know what I used to say at the seminar when everybody else was saying to these people in the audience, sure, quit your jobs and go into the book <laughs> business, it's so rewarding. I'd say, if you have a job with Keep health it. insurance, you're out of your mind <laughs> to think of leaving. If you want to try to fool around selling books at night, that's what I did. On the weekends. Do it. Yeah. But don't quit any jobs for this. Because, and I, I don't know, everybody, you know, all of our colleagues are, I think, are kind of in a dream world about this, but nobody ever says, here's why you're wrong, Jack. I haven't heard that from nobody. Because yet. you're not. I'm afraid I'm not. Yeah. So but boy, it was fun. Before the, before the computers, it, it was just a riot to do this. Well, I, I had a good time in the 50s and 60s, I can tell you that. No, that's what I heard from your wife. Yes. But since then, it's been no But fun. she caught you. <laughs> As always. I can never get away with anything, can I? So, if I were to say to you, uh, the question that I've asked everybody else, uh, what no. do you think are the greatest cha challenges? Oh, sorry, wrong question. Wrong I, question. Thought you, I thought it was the young bookseller question. No, no, you'll get for that one. <laughs> what do you perceive as the great challenges facing our trade in the decades ahead? To exist? I'm not sure this is something that uh, you can fix by being smart. And, and that's always been the case, is that it's always been important in being in this business to not really think of it as a business. Because if you did, you really wouldn't do it. You have to accept the fact right away that the booksellers are the collectors. That was an important lesson I learned. Uh, I remember from Peter Howard. Uh, Peter Howard has always treated booksellers like royalty, in a sense. Yes, I know he yells at them and he makes them cry sometimes. But, but in terms of, of uh, discounts and terms and, and uh, things like that, and he understood and told me, this is way back in the, you know, in the 70s, the booksellers are the ones who really want the books. They can't keep them because they can't afford to. And I turned out to be just that way. I don't collect anything. I don't collect books. And I don't mind selling anything I have, but I have to be buying more every day. I'm only interested in acquiring it. That was always the fun part. That was a great treasure hunt. I, but now that you know everything that's out there, it's not as much fun. Well, uh, probably 90% of what's out there you know, but you can still uh, wander off into some little place in the middle of nowhere and find something, but it's, they're fewer and farther between. I did that, and, I, and they were hairpins, unfortunately. They, they were not. Why? They were not books. Because it was a little 19th century uh, salesman's sample book of hairpins with all the little paper labels and everything like it's that. Cute. It deserved to be preserved. So now it'll go in my house, and, and uh, when they carry me out of there, somebody else will have to deal with it. If they can find it. But is this a business? No. This is, to go back to your question, this is not a business. So, I don't understand computers. I don't understand merchandising or marketing. 
uh, we, one of our colleagues, uh, you know, has a press agent, and, uh, and and maybe more than one, for all I know. And I think the people that were the great booksellers of of um, when you started would just roll over in their graves at this. Yeah. But this will. The, you know, certain certain of these firms will survive because they're willing to do this stuff. But I don't think it has too much to do with book selling, really. Talk a little bit about the Rochester Book Fair, which I know you've been involved with for a number of years. And someone once told me that you sell books there from anywhere from six figures to one figure. Well, I don't remember selling any for six figures, but um, we certainly take them out for a, for a ride <laughs> and take them over there. What we're, what we're doing at regional book fairs now is selling books that are sort of generally available online for 15 to 45 dollars. And uh, uh, we're pricing them four dollars and five dollars and ten dollars. So we go to a regional fair, we scout the fair, we try to buy whatever's good. Uh, again, no good reason for it, but that's what we do. And then instead of sitting there with our hands folded for the next two days, uh, we're kind of rushed off our feet selling these cheap books to people. And people will buy those like mad. And, it's a, and the, the books get a new home and somebody's actually going to read them. But it's not antiquarian book selling. It's just something to keep you keep, busy. Keep you busy. If you're willing to rent, you know, rent the truck or destroy your, your vehicle and drive them there and haul them in there and haul them out, you know, this summer we did two. We did a Denver book fair and uh, and then Chicago the next weekend, and I think we sold 35 or 40 boxes of those books. All for it was a, four to five dollars. Yeah, range. it was a riot. It doesn't add up to much, but it was fun. It was a lot of invoice writing. Yes, if you do write invoices for yeah, we stuff. do. We do. Jennifer gets tired out from waiting on those people, but it's still better than just sitting there and going, it's "What am I doing?" Here? Yeah, you're gonna begin to question all these things that. So Rochester, we do the same thing that's there, and of course that's a little nicer because we're home. We have a yeah. little party for the exhibitors, and people come over to the house and spill their drinks on everything. It's, it's kind of do funny. they ever find anything? Sometimes they try to. What, what percentage of your business is made up of uh, direct selling uh, book fairs and, and internet? Can you pinpoint it? In well, that's way? different because I mean. You know, the, the higher end of our business used to account, at least in, if you analyze it in terms of gross sales, was a big part of it. Now the internet business is, you know, important. What value on your internet? What are you selling between X and Y? As I say, the, the listings are mostly under 1500 and, and uh, you know, almost, I would say, that the average sale is a lot closer to 150 or $250 than anything else. Are you selling mainly to privates or, or libraries or dealers or some balance in between? I think of the, I think there's much many more private sales out of that. Not much from institutions. Sometimes. Do do the librarians ever show up at the Rochester Book Fair? Yeah. Do they buy anything or do they just come to Gibbets? No. Well, once in a while they do. We're starting to hear from librarians now that want our help in, in deaccessioning uh, yeah. books that they Rob discovered that are valuable. Rob was, was saying, uh, Rob Well, I took Rob along, along on the, this thing that we're working on now, and uh, the librarians uh, don't know what to do with these books. They don't know anything about them. Uh, they were bought by a librarian from an earlier period, and there's some very good books there. So what do they do? Uh -huh. Are they looking to sell them, or are they looking yeah, to I trade they, them? I think they're going to, I think they're going to sell them to us. Uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think they're really looking to acquire too much. They, you know, these institutions need to raise money. People are being fired and laid off. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Talk a little bit about auctions and uh, what effect they have on this trade. Well, um, I'm not a big, uh, not a big player in the auction market. I'm, my philosophy in the old days was that was the dumbest way to buy inventory, because the whole world uh, looked at it. And I kind of learned over the years that that wasn't the case. You could 
you could buy books at auction and, and resell them. Uh, but I don't haunt the, uh, the auction house. When there's a good sale, I'll go down. But if, if, if um, you don't really want something that's good at an auction, it's still difficult to buy it for stuff. Because everybody and anybody knows it's there. Well, and they'll still get some money for it. I mean, things do fail. There's, you know, there's, there's been some recent auctions that are perfect examples of some of the things have gone wild and a lot of things that uh, we would have been very excited about a few years ago did not do well. Um, you know, you've got to have some people queued up for these. And, they, and that isn't the case right now. And the trade is not spending money and holding up uh, ordinary books at auction. They don't have the money to do it. Well, we're, in, we're nearing the end. I want to ask you that, that question I asked that you heard coming in. If, yeah. some, if a young bookseller would come to you and say, I'd like to be a bookseller, what's your advice? And you would say to them, no. I'd say, well, I'd say to them uh, what you heard me say to them uh, all those years, which is uh, dabble at it. You know, remember we have all these people there and all they'd be worried about is designing their logo and their yeah. business equipment and everything. I said, yeah. well, look, why don't you go out and see if you can scout some books yeah. and, uh, and find a way to sell them. And, and I couldn't decide whether that, that was just, that was like advising people about, about, you know, harness for your horse and buggy because uh, these younger people are so tied into the idea of computers and merchandising and all this stuff. And you know what? They're probably right. But uh, I'm not so sure about You got to, how do you even, I, I think you should probably have, be buying and selling 10 books, before, 10 books for 10 years before you decide you want to, you're worried about what your logo looks like. Uh, some, of the, some of the people at the seminar were older people who had changed professions and they seem to be very interested in well, booksellers. You think, listen, they listen to you and I, and we tell, and all we do is tell them about all the stories where we, where we did great. And uh, you think that doesn't sound good to some guy who's been stuck in the middle of a big corporation and just getting uh, everything landing on him from above and, and kicking everybody below him? He says, hey, I want to do this too. <laughs> uh, but how would you? If you and I don't know how to do this now, how, how, how are they going to do it? I have no idea. I, told, I said that every year at the seminar. I said, I've been doing this for more than 35 years. I'm very well capitalized. I have a fantastic inventory. And i got a wife that knows everything about books. And I don't know how to be a bookseller. You think I'm going to teach you to do it in five days? <laughs> I wouldn't know how to teach you. Oh, go, yeah. out and see, go out and see if you get sucked into it the way I got sucked into it. That's, that's the if I hadn't found it. those two books and, and made that money on them, I probably would have done nothing but practice law. Or become a hockey player. I'd be player. dead now. I'm playing again. You're playing again? You're, My you cardiologist is dead set against it. Yeah, I think. But I can't do anything anymore. But sometimes, for, in, in the, whole, the whole game, for like seven seconds, it comes back to me. <laughs> seven seconds. It's all it takes. The rest of the time. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> Our time is up. Okay. Jeff, thanks very much for your insight and for yeah. your comments. Enjoyed it tremendously.